Hey. All right, so um, as you probably have noticed, the exam two has not been graded. Um, so it'll be done hopefully tomorrow, but uh, by the end of, by Friday at the latest. Um, so you can expect it by then. And now we're on to heat exchangers. Okay. So with heat exchangers, they actually are going to involve many chapters here. So we have um, in a heat exchanger, there's can be chapter three involved in it, chapter uh, eight can be chapter seven in there. Um, and we're looking at kind of an overall uh, system that's, you know, exchanging heat one passage to another, okay, and it involves convection, conduction. Um, so we'll get started. The first off section of slides um, talks about heat exchangers in general and then uses one type of analysis, which is the log mean temperature difference that we saw a little bit in Chapter 8 of. And then the second set of slides brings in the effectiveness NTU method, which is another set of um, solution method. The log mean temperature difference one is a little bit more restrictive. The NTU isn't, so but the log mean temperature difference is a little better for introducing heat exchangers. So that's what we that's what's in the first section, and then the effectiveness NTU is in the second. Second set of slides, I should say. All right. All right. So the simplest versions of heat exchangers is a concentric tube heat exchanger. And that's what you have in a lab. There's a thermal science lab that we have that has a heat exchanger and it's concentric tubes. So it's just the one tube inside of another, okay? And this is where we're trying to exchange heat from one fluid to another and there's a solid in between it, right? That's a heat exchanger. So the concentric tube we have one flowing fluid in this metal tube, and then outside of that, we have another tube over it, which has a different fluid flowing through it, right? So one of the fluids will be a hot fluid, and one of them will be cold, right? Because they're exchanging heat, so you have to have that temperature difference that drives it. So parallel flow is where they're both entering in the same direction, okay? Counter flow is where we have one fluid showing left or right here, and then the other fluid going from right to left, so they're in opposite flow directions. Okay, so this is our concentric tube heat exchangers, the simplest, right? If we were to look at kind of a sliver of this, it would just look like you have your outer tube, you have your inner tube with some kind of wall there, right? So this is the wall with the inner flowing fluid in the center, and then that outer flowing through fluid around the outside. Um, but what ends up happening, and we'll see this in a couple of slides when we see the, how the temperature is changing, you get actual superior performance with the counter flow heat exchanger. And the simplest uh, reason for that is if you're both fluids are entering here, so right at this sliver, uh, we have heat exchange has the large temperature difference. So you get very high. Uh, transfer heat at that initial inlet. But as you work further and further along this tube, these fluids get closer and closer in temperature. And if you're right here now, the delta T between you know this fluid and this one is small. So you're going to get a very small heat transfer um, in, in relationship to the initial here. And this temperature is never going to be it's always going to be, you know, above, if this is the hot side and this is the cold side, they're never going to meet in temperature, right? Well, in a counter flow, when you're right here and you're transferring heat from that fluid to the other, you have a delta T. Well, as you work your way through, you have a delta T, delta T. It never gets to a point where the delta T is very small. You have this over the full length of it, you have this nice delta T for a driving force for heat transfer. And then the other thing that happens is because this is an outlet right here and this is an outlet way over here, the outlets 
temperatures are not dependent on each other. This outlet is dependent on this, and this one is dependent on this. So what can actually happen is, if this is one side, this can drop below the temperature on this side. And you'll see, um, so if this is the hot side, the hot side can exit at a lower temperature than the cold side increases. That can't happen in parallel flow because they're both exiting at the same location. All right, some other designs. We have cross flow heat exchangers. Okay, so this has this kind of this, you know, across it has the flow. So it's in the name. But what's being shown here is you have tubes. Okay, so these are what's called unmixed. So you have fluid flowing through these tubes in both of these cases, in the left and the right. And then you have the cross flow where this is unmixed because it's flowing through these kind of you know, baffles or these, um, you know, these plates here that's keeping that flow right across it and it's not mixing. Where in this version, there's there aren't these plates, so the fluid can come across, move, and this fluid can move across and, and you end up getting this mixing. So this is mixed while this is unmixed, where the flow through the tube is always unmixed because you're not crossing flow from one to the, you're not mixing the flow from one tube to the other. Okay. So, and then performance, when you have mixing, your performance is influenced by it, so it changes. Um, we have another method is this shell and tube heat exchangers. Okay. So here we have the tubes are what's right here. We have fluid running through it right here. We have a tube right there, here, and here. So that's the tube. And then fluid, the other fluid, so this is our tube inlet, goes through those and comes out the outlet here, right? The shell then is the fluid flows around those tubes. So that's the shell. So that's flowing around it. And in this case, here's our inlet. But what they have is baffles here. So we have a plate here, 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 and here. So that makes the flow have to do this flow path like this. So that forces more mixing, more turbulence, and it reduces, it makes sure that flow path is all the way through it because if those baffles weren't there that flow would just want to go right from there and have that short circuit that resistance for the flow is the smallest directly where if we put these baffles in here it forces that flow through all this okay we can also change the number of flow passes so number of passes, it can be varied. And that's what you see. So up here, it was one shell pass, one tube pass. You went from this side, inlet to outlet, that's one. Went from inlet to outlet, one, okay? Down here, we have one shell pass, but two tube passes, okay? So the shell just went from the inlet, around the baffles, to the outlet. But the tube goes in, so that's one pass, and turns back around, and that's, the second pass, so that was two tube passes. Here, we have in, out, so one pass, three, four, okay? Where the shell has two passes, because you got one right here, and then it goes across it again here, two. Okay, so we have two shell passes, four tube passes. So those will, those things will influence the heat heat transfer to. Another method of heat exchangers is compact heat exchangers. Okay. Okay, so this is for large heat rates per unit volume. Okay. And that's very beneficial with a gas. Because a gas, you're going to typically have low heat transfer versus especially of a gas to a liquid, your gas side is going to be what limits you. Okay. Because 
in convection, you're you got basically an order of magnitude or or more less when you're transferring heat from a gas to a wall versus from a liquid to a wall. Okay, your convection coefficient just is not as high. Okay, so that will be done. You want more surface area, so that could be with a compact heat exchanger with fins. Um, you could put fins on that gas area to increase the surface area. So then we can get um, more of that heat transfer. Okay, so here we see different designs. We have we have this flat tube, flat tubes, continuous plates. We have our fin tube. We have three different fin tubes, A, B, C. Um, so through this flat tube, you have fluid flowing in this direction through these, and then you have uh, across these flat plates. Here you have a circular tube that it's flowing through, and then across the flat plates here. And then we have a circular tube, circular fins so flowing through here, and then you have fin around the outside of that surface. That fin increases the surface area for the air. Right? The air is going to touch all that different amount of surface area, which now will transfer more heat than if you just had those tubes, let's say in this last one, and you just flew, flow, you, you had air flow around those tubes. The surface area is now just that external area of that tube, where here, with, if this is air, you have all this thin area that you're getting to increase your surface area by. Okay. So that will help your amount of heat transfer you're getting from that, if that's a gas side, right? Or if you're trying to do gas to gas. So here we see situations that might be more of a gas to gas because you have uh, plate fin with fins on both sides, okay? Here's a single pass in D because you're just going across here and then here. So one pass through, here you have multi-pass because it's coming through and then it'll turn on this side back this way, and then here you see it turning. Here through, it'll turn on the other side, so you get these multi-pass. Um, but when you're flowing through, the other thing you see is those fins, right? If this is a gas flowing through here, you have all this surface area, okay, something like you would see on a, um, in your car, right, on its heat exchanger. And then on this side, you have you know, the surface area, and you see how they've closed off this part then through here. So this is closed off right here. So they're creating that uh, ceiling for it. All right, so then with these different designs of the heat exchanger, you have to calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient, okay? And when you're trying to design a heat exchanger, that's part of it. When we talked in thermo, back in thermo two or thermo one, you had a heat exchanger or a boiler or a condenser. You just said, oh, this is the Q. This is the Q from CUE. Now that Q has meaning in this class where we can transfer that Q to an overall convection coefficient and a surface area. So that's, then those have designs. So then now that becomes, okay, what is the design of this heat exchange? What is the design of this boiler or condenser now? Okay, so that's where we take it from Q to an actual shape and size right, and materials. Okay, design is that. We're looking at heat exchanger design calculations. Performance, that's that's when you you have a heat exchanger, right? And you're seeing how well it performs. So this is you have a heat exchanger. Here's when you're designing heat exchanger. Okay. So what does this overall heat transfer coefficient look like? Okay. So if we're doing the simplest case, so we see a more involved one down here, right? Well, let's take a look at what we drew here of this case, and we'll do a nice simple resistance network starting from, let's see, they start from cold to 
the hot side. Okay, so we'll call the inner tube has the cold fluid and the outer has the hot. Okay, so if we set it up and did our resistance network, that would look like the cold, and then we have resistance from convection on the cold side, which is just H cold times area cold, 1 over H cold times area cold. Now that gets to the inner surface wall, and then you have your wall resistance from conduction, right? If it's a cylinder like we see here, then that's you know a cylinder from chapter three that you gotta look at for wall resistance. It's a flat plate, now you have plain wall for that wall resistance. Okay? So now we're here, and we gotta go to our fluid, okay? That's our last resistor. And that's on our hot side in this case. Okay, and that gets us on the hot fluid side of the temperature. So that's our resistance network, and we can utilize that to get our overall convection coefficient for a simple case like I'm showing there. Okay, when I'm showing and I'm showing no fins, and what I'll get to is there's also no fouling is being shown. Okay, so here's a more describing more things that we can include, okay? And we have our one over overall convection, overall heat transfer coefficient in surface area, which is either on the cold side or the hot side, right? And you gotta be careful with that because this goes with this because the area could change from the hot side to the cold side. So if we're looking at this, the area this surface area on the hot side, the cold side, it's this surface area, so it could change. Okay. All right, so let's go through these different resistances here. Here we have the cold side convection, but it has with fins. Okay, so if we did that same system here, Cold running on the inside, hot on the outside of that tube. So with fins on the cold, that would be like you would have something like fins like this. See that inner surface. So that's transferring heat better from that flowing fluid on the inside to that surface wall. So this is our fin. Each one of these would be a fin. Okay. And so then we would have a fin array and because we've increased the surface here. So that's convection with fins. If we don't have fins, this just gets canceled to one, right? And you just have the surface area of what we showed right here. Okay, what we have in this part is fouling. And that's a, a buildup, okay? A lot of these heat exchangers, you're just running them continuously. If you're talking about a power plant or different fluids are cooling, you could just be running this 24 hours a day or, you know, every day or, you know, a lot of hours that you end up getting a buildup. So in this case, this would be, let me actually remove the fins for this description. So we just had surface wall with no fins. That would be a buildup right here of stuff that may be in your fluid. So if you're taking water from the river and using it in the inside, you're gonna get a buildup of stuff on that surface and maybe you need to clean it out every so often. But without that, it'll build up and have this fouling. It'll create this layer that now conduction has to go through, okay? We can, we have a table and the next slide will show the table to get that value. Now we have our wall, all right? That was in our last one. So that's the wall. And then here we have fouling on the hot side. So that would be on this surface right here, if you had buildup, okay? And then here, 
we have convection on the hot side with fins. Okay, so that's if now there was fins like this. Now that would be increasing the surface area that the hot side fluid is exposed to. Okay. And again, if you don't have fins, this just becomes one and you just have the surface area. Okay. All right, so where we get our fouling factor, 11, table 11.1 has some situations, the wall conduction resistance, RW, is, you know, chapter three, right? Whether it's plain wall, you know, or cylinder, we have our wall resistance, okay? Then overall, surface efficiency of the fin array, now this is chapter three. Again, chapter three fins, okay? So this is where we look at the overall efficiency, if there's fins on the cold side or on the hot side. Same equation, okay? But your answers will be different depending on the cold and hot and your arrangement, right? But it's the same general equation. So that's where you have the total surface area right here, and then the surface area of just the fins, okay? So when I'm talking about total surface area, again, you have the base, right? Fins plus exposed base. So if we were looking at something that looked like this, the, and you got fluid flowing here into the board, then your fin area is, you know, this, surface area right here, right? Or maybe just the side walls if this, these are thin, okay, as you flow in or out. So then, but the exposed base also has this surface area. There's another good one. And we'll see it in a minute. All right, so that would be the exposed base part. So this part, okay, here, 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 here. Fin would be the surface here, 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 here. Okay, add it all up. Then efficiency, we can get from this equation where this is again chapter three fins, where we have to get our M value, which is just based upon the convection coefficient and geometry. So this is for a straight fin. Equation. The last one is more of, if you wanna be extra accurate and you have fouling, so this basically, is a modifier for convection. Do following. Okay, let's take the example of, you just had a circular tube and you have convection to the wall. If you have following, following, you get this buildup, right? Well, your diameter just shrunk. Well, that's gonna change your convection. So that's kind of the modifier for it, okay? All right, so now getting into the design calculations, which is the log mean temperature difference, LMTD, okay? This method is what we're gonna talk about first. And it was kind of introduced in chapter eight. It's just the overall convection, overall um, convection coefficient, or overall heat transfer coefficient, surface area. Okay, so this is all from that, you know, your resistance network. You have your total heat 
that you're transferring, and then your log mean temperature difference. And we saw we were introduced to the log mean temperature difference back in chapter eight when we were looking at constant surface area, surface temperature and external surface temperature. Well, the same kind of equation applies. Log mean temperature difference, we just have delta T1, delta T2. So same delta T1, delta T2. But what is delta T1 and what is delta T2 depends upon the heat exchanger type. So right here is the counterflow heat exchanger. So delta T1 would be hot in minus cold out. Delta T2 is hot out minus cold in. So it's just looking at one side of the heat exchanger and then the other. Because you're flowing in the opposite direction, right? They're counterflow. So one's going one way, one's going the other. One is hot inlet, cold outlet. Two is hot outlet, cold inlet. Okay. And here's where you can see, again, as you're moving along, the driving force of heat transfer as you're moving along this, this um, heat exchanger. And you can get the situation where you have the hot sides dropping like this and the cold side increasing like this, right? And now you have this side below the this side. So this would end up having a different temperature than that. So that shows the cold side getting higher in temperature than the outlet of the hot side, right? So that's kind of the situation of showing why the counterflow ends up having better performance than the parallel flow. All right, so here's the parallel flow, right? So parallel flow, delta T1. So if you're looking at hot inlet, delta T1, because they're both entering on the same side. And this is the cold inlet, okay? So that's where we're entering on the left. Exiting is our delta T2, so that's the two outlets, okay? Well, if we look at that, you can see that the outlets are never going to cross each other because the driving force, as you're moving along, here's this is that that's the driving force for heat transfer here. Here's our driving force here. Well, they're never the outlet temperature is going to cross in a parallel flow because then you would be transferring heat in the wrong direction. Right. So that's why the counterflow gives us a better performance. We have that wide, nice, consistent delta T from the inlets to the outlets. We're here, you have a large driving force initially, but then it drops and um, you don't you don't have that nice consistent driving force. Okay, so for equivalent um, overall heat transfer coefficients in surface areas and inlet temperatures, you're going to get a better performance out of the counterflow than the parallel flow. Okay. The cases of the shell and tube and the cross flow for the log mean temperature differences, so that's for cross flows this situation, shell and tube is this, okay. You use the the counter flow log mean temperature difference equation, so this one. Okay, this always did the same. Okay, whether it's parallel or counter flow, it's just what is delta T1, what is delta T2. So with these situations, which are a little bit more muddled, um, you have a modifier F factor. Okay, and that's the only thing that dif that's different. And where you can find those is actually in the supplemental material. So this is the supplemental. So it came with your book, and if it didn't, I actually have it up on Canvas. Okay, so up on the, at the end of the our Canvas site at the bottom of that, I have the supplemental material, and it's just. For this part, it would just be figures for this, okay? Just to look up F for these designs, okay? So left and, so will they always be at the left and right? It should, yeah. So if they're gonna go with 
hot in minus cold out. So that's always this. So as long as, I mean, it could be, always think of it with this, more is the better one to think of, is hot inlet minus cold outlet. Because that could be on the other side too. If we just switch these to go this way and this way. Okay, so, um, so the really the big thing is that hot inlet, cold outlet, hot outlet, cold inlet. Here again, because you it's not left and right, you could have it flow like this with the inlets on the right side, right? So it's more delta T uh, one is the inlets, delta T two is the outlets in the parallel flow, and in minus out with hot and then in out minus in. Okay. Okay, so again, we just use the supplemental material to get S. So depending upon what that shell and tube looks like, cross flow, we pick our figure and get our, our modifier F that we multiply times that log mean temperature difference. All right, so that all dealt with Newton's law of cooling, but we also have the CUE, right? If we have our boundary of just this fluid, which is the hot fluid in this case, we have our inlet here. Outlet, right? Well, there's no work crossing our boundary. We have heat transfer crossing our boundary. There's it's steady state, or we're assuming steady state. Okay, if we neglect potential and kinetic energy, all you have left is mass flow rate carrying in enthalpy on the left, and mass flow rate carrying out enthalpy on the right, and that's going to be equal to your heat transfer. Okay, so you get this equation. Our enthalpy is I in heat transfer, right? Um, and then on the cold side, you get the other, right? So what's leaving the hot goes into the cold. Okay, if we have our boundary around it. Okay, so those are going to be equal to each other, right? So if we know some of this, we can use the COE to get the other. So if we knew a lot of information about the, the hot side and maybe just one inlet on the cold side and the mass flow rates, we could use that to get um, information about the, the outlet of the cold side, right? Because these two Q's are the same. All right, one other thing we'll do though is we'll take it to specific heats. Okay, so if we do the heat capacity rates, so that's what we'll use in the heat exchanger analysis, is this capital C. Okay, first off though, we'll use you know, delta enthalpy is CP delta T. Okay. That's for ideal gas and incompressible liquid or solid. So always for ideal gas, incompressible liquid or solid with negligible delta P, so drop, pressure drop. Um, so We'll have that CP delta T, assuming no phase change, because we're not using enthalpy, we're using CP and change in temperature. If we have latent energy, the temperature's not gonna change, right? All right, so we look at this, and we're basically gonna use the heat capacity rates. So mass flow rate times the specific heat on the hot side is just the heat capacity rate of the hot side. Mass flow rate, Time specific heat on the cold side is just the heat capacity rate of the cold. Okay, so you'll see this version more often with just the heat capacity rates. 
All right, so now special operating conditions. So these special situations. If we have a very, very high um, heat capacity rate on the hot side, that's the situation where now that is going to infinity, we're condensing a vapor, okay? So that would keep the hot side at the same temperature, and then the cold side's increasing, right? So you have heat going this way, right? From the hot to the cold. So that's pulling heat from that condensing vapor right here, okay? In the evaporating liquid, we have this dropping, right? So that's changing, but this, this side is staying the same temperature because it's evaporating. We have that late energy. So you have heat going again into that way, and heat is transferring. Even though this temperature is staying the same, we're evaporating that liquid. Okay, so that's this situation. So we have these two special cases, A and B. And then the last special case is a little bit different, is if the, the heat capacity rates are the same. If you remember the heat capacity rates is mass flow to the cold side, specific heat of the cold side, mass flow to the hot side, specific heat of the hot side. So that would be if the mass flow rates are the same from on each side and the specific heats, or we can neglect the difference in the specific heats. So we can say, oh, maybe we have the same mass flow rates on each side, and we're going to say, oh, the uh, specific heats with change in temperature difference is negligible. So then that makes the two heat capacity rates the same. So maybe we have we have air on one side, and we're transferring heat through heat exchanger to air on the other side, and the mass flow rates are the same. And we're going to make that assumption to make the analysis equal, easier. And what happens with that is the delta T1 and delta T2 are the same which are also gonna just be the log mean temperature difference. So that makes calculating uh, back to that equation right here for, we know the log mean temperature difference is the same as delta T1 and delta T2. And we just put it in here, okay. All right, so now we have some examples for the first set of slides here. 11.4. A heat recovery device involves transferring energy from the hot flue gases passing through an annular tube to pressurized water flowing through the inner tube of the annulus. The inner tube has inner and outer diameters of 24 and 30 millimeters and is connected by eight struts to an insulated outer tube of 60 millimeter diameter. Each strut is three millimeters thick and is integrally fabricated with the inner tube from carbon steel. We have our thermal conductivity given to us. And then they give us the schematic you see at the top. Okay. And then they say, consider conditions where it's water at 300 Kelvin flows through the inner tube at 0.161 kilograms per second, while flue gases at 800 Kelvin flow through the annulus, maintaining a convection coefficient of 100 watts per meter squared Kelvin on both the struts and the outer surface of the inner tube. What is the rate of heat transfer per unit length of tube from gas to water? All right, so they gave us dimensions, right? So we have we have geometry and we have information about the material, okay? Because they gave us thermal conductivity. So we have geometry and material here, okay? And we have the inlet temperatures of the gas which is the hot side, because it's at 800 Kelvin, and the water is the cold side, because it's at 300. And then we also have the mass flow rate, okay? And they gave us the convection coefficient on the flue gas 
this is the for the gas side. All right, so we have water flowing through this inner part and air flowing through each of these sections. Okay, and they want us to find the heat rate per unit length. So that they ask it a little funny, but it's more about what is that kind of initial heat rate right at that section as it's entering when they're talking about per unit length because we don't have anything with outlet, right? We only have inlet, so it's really like what's that heat rate initially right there? Well, the COE deals with the outlet, so we don't have that. We don't have this the COE equations. We do have um, the not maybe not the log mean temperature difference because again we don't have the outlet. But we do have if we just look at Newton's law of cooling, just right at the inlet. Okay, right here from this point to this point, or not that, from this point to the fluid flowing in there, we can just we can use solve for that heat rate. Okay. And that's just with our hot in that's just I. And that is just at that inlet, because as you work your way through this tube, the temperature is going to be dropping and your heat that's being transferred is different. So it's really the heat rate per unit length and it's really right at that inlet, right? It's not valid as you work your way through. All right, so now if we do that, we need to, we have the inlet temperatures, we need to figure out these two values, the overall convection coefficient area or them two combined, right? And that's the resistance network. Okay, so if we look at that, we'll do that real quick. We have the cold side on the inside. And it just has convection to that inner wall. Then we have the wall, resistance of the wall. Okay, now we're on the air side. And the air side now has fins. Because you have air flowing through here, 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 and you got this surface area extra protruding length where this is the base of your fin here as it comes out your air is flowing over it so that's a fin okay so that means we have a fin a fi overall fin array efficiency on the hot side okay all right so there's our equation that I just wrote, and we're looking for this. Okay, so one over it is our resistance network that you see here. Okay, so we have we have convection without fins on the cold side, and we have convection with fins on the hot side. And then we have the wall resistance. Okay, so we got to go through each of those because we're looking for this. All right, so the wall. As a cylinder, okay, so we just go from chapter three for cylinder, and we get our resistance, and that's very small. We'll see, okay, probably that we could have neglected this. Let's also, oh, let me go through the assumptions too. Steady state, like I mentioned, um, we're going to assume constant properties, it's one dimensional induction in the strut, so that's because it's a fin, we're going to think of adiabatic outer surface conditions that's saying we're not getting any heat transfer out okay this way um, neglecting any radiation we also are saying fully developed flow 
and we're neglecting fouling. So that's why that resistance isn't there. We would need more information to include fouling. Like we'd need to be able to look something up in 11.1 to know what that value would be, or it would be given in the problem. Okay. So we have now our wall resistance. So we'll do the next easy one with the cold side. So this is our cold side convection, and this is internal flow. So we see chapter eight right here. Okay. All right, so we have internal flow, we get Reynolds number, and it told tells us it's turbulent. We assumed fully developed, so we go and grab our correlation from chapter eight. Use it to solve for our convection coefficient, and we get this. Okay, do our one over HA for the cold side, and we get a resistance. So that's a magnet order of magnitude high, one more higher than the wall. Okay. Now we have the hot side. Convection. And it has its width fins, right? So that equation they gave us the convection coefficient on that side in the problem. So we need to figure out our overall fin efficiency in our surface area. So our overall fin efficiency is this equation. So that requires us to get the fin area, the overall area, which is the fins plus the base, and the fin efficiency. Okay, going through, we have eight fins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight fins, and they're straight fins. So it's this surface area, this surface area on one side and the other. Okay, so we have diameter given, the diameter is given so we can work with out that, what that surface area is. And that's where we have the two sides, length times width of it, and eight fins. So we got our fin area. Total area is a fin, and then this is our exposed base. Okay, so we did pi d, so like there wasn't any fins. So we took that whole pi d times the length, and then we subtract off what the base of each fin takes up. And that's the eight times the thickness of the fin. Okay, so that's our total area. So we got our areas figured out. Now we need our fin efficiency. Okay, so that's where we go into our fin efficiency. So this is the efficiency of a single fin. And it's a straight fin again. So we need M. So this is for straight fin equation. So we go through those steps, plug it back in, we get our fin efficiency 0.911, 91.1%. Put it into our overall fin array efficiency, we get 93.1% or 0.931. And we go back and we put it into our resistance for the hot side, and we get 0.0347. So when we combine those resistances, we see negative three, negative four, and this is, pro this is negative two. So the biggest resistance is on the air side, which is if you're doing air to water, that's typically going to be the case. And that's even, in this case, we even had thins, right? If we didn't have thins, that resistance right here that we calculated would be way higher of uh, transferring the heat. So that resistance would be even not as well, right? All right, so our overall heat transfer coefficient times area on the cold side is 23.6. Okay, so we 
bring that back into our equation here, and we can get our heat transfer per unit length right at the inlet. Again, that changes as you move through the, the heat exchanger. All right, next one we have a supplemental problem. Uh, it is the design of a two-pass shell and tube heat exchanger to supply vapor for the turbine of an ocean thermal energy conversion system based on a standard Rankine power cycle. The power cycle is to generate two megawatts at an efficiency of 3%. Ocean water enters tubes of the heat exchanger at 300 Kelvin and, is, and its desired outlet temperature is 292 Kelvin. The working fluid of the power cycle is evaporated in the shell of the heat exchanger at its phase change temperature of 290. The overall heat transfer coefficient is known. So we know the overall heat transfer coefficient is right here. We also know things, it's a Rankine cycle. We have our work net out and we have our efficiency. So if we go back and jog our minds of heat trend, or of thermo one or thermo two for a heat engine, We had this in this class. I think double check how they arrange that equation. It just looks like this because they don't do the Q dot; they do the lowercase Q. Okay, so we have the efficiency is three percent. We have what we're going to get out, which is the two megawatts. So now we need to figure out because we're looking for the heat exchanger to supply vapor. So that's the boiler, right? So we're looking for that heat in. Okay, so from this equation, we can get the Q, okay, to get the heat that we need to provide in this heat exchanger, right? Next we thing we have, when we look, we have the water's inlet and outlet temperature. Okay, and you see that down here. So we have, and that water ends up being the high temperature. So we have both, hot water in and hot water out because we're evaporating another fluid, right? That's the cold water in and out, which is the same temperature. You see that here. So hot water in, 300, out, 292 Kelvin, and they probably picked this small delta T. And maybe for marine life, they have a minimal delta T they want, okay? And then also we want to get that other side, which is this evaporating fluid, the working fluid, it evaporates at 290, so we gotta have a delta T to transfer that heat. Okay, so we're have our heat going this way, right? All right, so this evaporating fluid has its enthalpy changing, so that's why you see this temperature staying the same, right? It's got the phase change going on. All right, so we have kind of our setup here. So they gave us some information about the power cycle. We have inlet and outlet on the hot side, and we have inlet and outlet on the cold side because it's the same temperature. So we have temperatures, and they want us to figure out the evaporation area. So this is perfect for the log mean temperature difference, right? And then water flow. So let's see what we got here. All right, so we have the equation I already showed you. Solve it for a 3% efficiency, two megawatts of work out. We need to put in 66.7 megawatts of heat. Okay? So then we can go to our log mean temperature difference for a two pass shell and tube heat exchanger.
it has that modifier for the counter flow. So go back. Let's, see. Let's go find it here. Shell and tube, right? Heat exchanger. So we just have this modifier times the log mean temperature of the counter flow. So that means for its log mean. And we use the log mean temperature right here, UA times that log mean temperature difference. All right, so we're looking for evaporator area. It gave us the overall heat transfer coefficient. So we have this. We're looking for this. We just solved for the heat because we got it right here. We need to get F from the supplemental material, and then we need to calculate our log mean temperature difference of a counter flow. So that's it right here, getting the delta T1, delta T2. Okay. And we get five. Going to our supplemental material, we can easily find from the figures what they need for the figures for a two-pass shell and tube heat exchanger. It's figure this figure in the supplemental material, and we find out we just need a factor. It ends up being just a factor one, so we're not really changing anything there. Plug it all back in. We get a surface area of 11,100 meters squared. Okay, so. That is huge, right? Next is water flow they asked us for. Okay, so we know Q, right? We figured it out right here. But we also have inlet and outlet temperatures of the water. So that means we have COE, right? From the inlet to the outlet. If we have Q and we have inlet and outlet temperatures, we can use COE. And that's what you see here. So. There's COE. So heat, we know. Specific heat, we look it up. All right, we have the inlet and outlet temperatures. Use it to get mass flow rate, and we see a very large mass flow rate also. Any questions? Let's move on to the next slide. We have the effectiveness in NTU method. Okay, so still heat exchangers, same heat exchangers. We're implementing a new method, which is just this effectiveness NTU method, and we'll find it is more useful for different situations versus the last one, but the last one's better for introducing heat exchangers. All right. So with effectiveness NTU, we also have to define what effectiveness is and what is NTU to use that method. First off, we start off, what are some of the limitations of the log mean temperature difference? So we, the last one, it's set of slides, it's really good for design problems. So that means that's when we know our fluid flow rates, we know our inlet temperatures, as well as a outlet temperature. So those are known. And then we're just trying to get a surface area and an outlet temperature. So that's our unknown. Okay, that's, we're designing it. We're trying to size it, right? If we're trying to do instead a performance calculation, so this is where we do know our um, heat exchanger, but we don't know 
outlet temperatures. So in this case, we know the heat exchanger area and let's just say geometry. Unknown is our outlet temperatures. Because if we don't know both outlet temperatures, you can't use COE. If you knew one of the outlet temperatures like you have here, you can use conservation energy to get the other one, right? Because we know in the last set of slides, you knew that Q is M dot CP delta T. If Q is the same and you have temperature uh, delta T on, on one side and the flow rates, you know Q and you can utilize that equation for the other outlet temperature. But if you don't know either outlet temperature, which is what is the case in a performance calculation, now the log mean temperature difference actually requires you to iterate. Okay, you got to guess one and go through the log mean temperature calculation and conservation energy and see whether it all works out and then iterate again. Okay, so it's not really good for performance calculation. Where this new method that I'm about to get into, the effectiveness NTU method, or a lot of times people will just call it the NTU method can be good for either case, design problems or performance calculations, and it doesn't require iteration, okay? So if you're unsure which one to use, the log mean, or the NTU method works for either case. Okay. All right, so now we gotta define things that help us in the effectiveness NTU method. So we gotta define Effectiveness, right? All right, so effectiveness, we have Q over Q max. This is actual that you will have in the heat exchanger. And then this is our maximum. So that means you're only gonna get zero to one, right? Most you can get is one, least zero, okay, on your effectiveness. Maximum possible heat rate. So then we're gonna define what that max is. Okay, and that is, these are your two inlets, right? Because that's your biggest temperature driving force, the two inlet temperatures, okay? And then you're gonna use the minimum heat capacity rate, okay? That's, remember, mass flow rate times CP, but it's the minimum, so if, the hot side is less than the cold side's heat capacity rate, you use the hot side for min. If the cold side's less than the hot side, you use the cold side for the min heat capacity rate. That means then the max is the other one. But when you're looking at Q max, that's your limiting factor, that mass flow rate times CP. So you need C min and that inlet temperatures, and that gets you the max. All right, so NTU, number of transfer units. It's a dimensionless parameter, okay? And its magnitude just tells us about how much heat, right? So if we, we're basically taking U over A, which is our, our design parameters, right, of our heat exchanger. That's the things that tell us about geometry and materials that we're using and divide it by our minimum heat capacity rate. And that gets us our number of transfer units. If you need more heat to be transferred, your number of transfer units is gonna go up, okay? All right, here, we're just bringing back our equations from the COE, okay? So that's what you see right here. Okay, mass flow rate, change in enthalpy, 
on the hot side, which we can just do CP delta T and do our heat capacitor rates because this is just, again, mass rate times the CP of the hot side. And this is mass rate CP of the cold side. All right, well, if we bring back the effectiveness equation, which is Q over Q max, right? We saw it right here, Q over Q max. And we move it around. So then that Q is equal to effectiveness times Q max. We've already defined what Q max is, and that's. So that's already substituted in. Okay, we up here, we have Q max, we substitute it in, we get this. Okay. Well, this is where, depending on what you're trying to do, if you're trying to do a performance calculation or a design calculation. So here's performance, right? That means again, you know geometry. I don't know how to spell geometry. And materials, right? Because that gets you NTU, right? And then you know the specific heat or the heat capacity rates, right? So, and this ratio is C min over C max, okay? Heat capacitor rate min over heat capacitor rate max. All right, so if you have these two parameters, we can use them to get the effectiveness. So that means you just need geometry, mass flow rate specific heats, and inlet temperatures, and that'll get you an effectiveness. And if you have an effectiveness, you can use COE now, because you would, if you have effectiveness, you can put it in there. Now you get Q, and you can use Q and the COE to get your outlet temperatures, because you already have inlet, inlet specific heat, specific heat. And how do you get this effectiveness? So we have a table in our book. 11.3, which gives us a set of a whole bunch of equations, which some, a lot of them are, can be quite big equations and they're dependent upon um, the type of heat exchanger you're, you have. Or we have figures, which you just look up the value. And it's just dependent upon the CR and the NTU. Okay, so the lookup is faster for a single value, right? Just like typical with figures. Equations are really nice if you have like a design project or senior design, something like that where you need to iterate your design a whole bunch, uh, see trends, do a parametric study, let's say, then the equations are a lot, a lot nicer. Looking up is nice for a single value like you have on a test, right? All right, so this is performance calculations. This is where we're going from the NTU and CR to effectiveness, right? So we're going from ge knowing geometry materials and inlet temperatures, mass rates, specific heats, and we're getting effectiveness and going to outlet temperatures. The other wet method is design, right? Design calculations. Now we know effectiveness. Again, mass rates, CP, this is CR again. Effectiveness we would get from, we would know Q max. Let's see right here. Design calculations. We would solve for Q, Q max. So that's inlet temperatures dependent. Effectiveness we would get 
from knowing actual Q. So from our COE, we would know an, one inlet temperature in one, at least one inlet and one outlet, right? We would know the, in, we, we know both of the inlet temperatures, but we would know one outlet temperature. So we could use COE for this one or this side, okay? And that would then tell us effectiveness, okay? Okay, so this way though, then we could use those two things to get the NTU, which tells us about the design, tells us about the um, the convection or the overall heat transfer coefficient and area we need. All right, so this now now we're solving for the design, the material kind of thing, information that we need. Okay. So either way it works for the effectiveness NTU, whether it's the performance calculation and you're going from knowing the geometry and materials and mass story, it's heat capacity and inlet temperatures to effectiveness and then we can get our outlet temperature or and the design method when we end up knowing the effectiveness because we have an outlet temperature for one side uh, so then we can calculate the effectiveness and we know again mass flow rates and specific heats and utilizing that we can get what that design needs to be the overall heat transfer coefficient okay and those have a different set of equations so this table 11.4 is equations and then the figures is you know look up a single value in the figure We have a special case of evaporation boiling condensation. So with that, if you're looking at the heat capacity ratio, which is heat capacity ratio min over heat capacity ratio max, if something has evaporation boiling or condensation, that means the max, when that occurs, you're gonna have infinity on the denominator, which makes this ratio zero. Okay, so that case, when C max is infinite, then you have this equation down here. You don't have a figure to look up, okay? Because this is the simplest equation for, so it has equation only. There isn't a figure for this. So this is the simplest equation. All the other cases get into more complex equations. And that's why and that's where you have the figures, more figures. Any questions? We'll finish the quick examples next class and do some exam uh, longer examples. Okay. And that's it for today. We'll meet again on Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Thank you.